Amen. So in Exodus chapter 20, uh, of course, uh, this is where you find the Ten Commandments. And, you know, if, if a sin is listed on the Ten Commandments, you know, it, it, it ranks. You know, we should probably pay a little bit more attention. Of course, we should pay attention to all of God's commandments, and there's a lot of them. There's a lot of other things that aren't listed specifically on these Ten Commandments that are the commandments of the Lord. We should care about all of it. But when you see a list that God gives out, and they are known as the Ten Commandments, and that if we were to keep these commandments, you know, uh, we would be, you know, loving our neighbor as ourself. And there, these are, the, you know, some very important things. So whenever you see a, a sin that's addressed here, you know, maybe we should pay a little bit more attention to it. And I want to focus in there where it says in verse 13, Thou shalt not kill, thou shalt not commit adultery, thou shalt not steal, thou shalt not bear false witness against thy neighbor. So there's several, you know, four sins right there that are listed in the Ten Commandments, you know, and we, most people would think about these sins and say, yeah, that's pretty bad. They would say, thou shalt not kill. You know, most people would agree with that. They'd say, that's, that's a terrible sin. You know, if you are accused of being a murderer, that's not good. That's bad. That's just, uh, you know, people would, that registers with them. Thou shalt not commit adultery. You know, that's kind of gone by the wayside in our society a little bit, but, you know, by and large, you know, we would understand that that's a serious sin. And then verse 16, thou shalt not bear false witness against thy neighbor. You know, we like to say that's talking about lying, and, you know, and I understand that it is, but it's also referring to the fact that, you know, you're not going to falsely accuse somebody and cause them to be punished by the law. But, you know, verse, verse 15 is kind of one that we know it's there, we know it's wrong to do, we know it happens a lot. And, and if we're honest, you know, we might even be a little bit more guilty of this, I mean, than, than probably the, the other ones. I mean, you can't kind of kill, you know, you, you, you you can maybe tell a little bit of a white lie, but you can't sort of kill somebody. You either, you either killed someone or you didn't. Right. You know, you, you either committed adultery or you didn't. But when it comes to stealing, sometimes I feel like we think in our minds there's this gray area. Well, it's not technically stealing, but look, it's on there. It's on the list. And if what we're doing is in any way, shape, or form construed as stealing, you know, we've committed a major sin. And I want to preach tonight about the fact that, we, that stealing is a sin. Stealing is a sin. And, you know, obviously the Bible condemns it. And you're there in Exodus, but you go over to Hosea chapter 4. Hosea chapter 4. Keep something in Exodus and go to Hosea chapter 4. The Bible's in Leviticus 19. Ye shall not steal, neither deal falsely, not, neither lie one to another. Verse 13 says, Thou shalt not defraud thy neighbor, and neither rob him. The wages of him that is hired shall not abide with thee all night until the morning. So we often think about stealing as just... You know, somebody running into a bank with a ski mask and a gun and just, you know, holding up the teller. But the Bible shows us that there's other ways that, that, that robbery or stealing is committed. It's not always just this violent act that is out in the open. You know, there's, the, there's dealing falsely. You know, saying, oh yeah, it's worth this much. Selling a car, selling a vehicle. Is there anything wrong with it? Nope, nothing wrong with it. You know, then they get it down the road. I mean, we hear stories about you know, people will sell a car because the engine has a knock in it. You know, it's throwing a rod, which is catastrophic. I mean, you have to replace it. And so instead of taking the hit, you know, what, what I've heard of people doing, I used to work in an oil change place, so I heard some of these stories, is there's this old trick of, you know, you could take a bunch, of, I don't know if I should be telling you guys this. <laughs> hey, I trust you. <laughs> tell us, tell us. <laughs> I got to know. <laughs> oh, you say it's got a knock? Funny, I have the same problem. <laughs> right? <laughs> but you could take a bunch of sawdust. And you could put it in that engine with the oil and, and sod it up, and it would, it, would, it would muffle that knock for a little while. It would kind of make, make everything work straight. And this is, you know, I'd have never seen it, but this is the rumor that was out there. <laughs> and so you make sure it doesn't have any sawdust in the engine. Because after you sell that, that uh, title over, it's your car now. And it's your fault, you know, for not seeing if it had sawdust in the engine. I, it's out there. Things like that, where people are going to say, well, I didn't, it's not like I took a gun and put it into his head and said, you know, empty your wallet. <coughs> I didn't mug the guy. Yeah, but maybe we're dealing falsely. You know, maybe we're not telling the whole truth. <coughs> we're defrauding our neighbor. <coughs> we're, li we're, we're lying one to another. He says there at the end, the wages of him that is hired shall not abide with thee all night until the morning. So the Bible teaches that employees should be paid every day. That at the end of the day, you're to be paid. Now, obviously, that's not the way it works in our society. You know, society has changed. And, of course, you know, back then that was kind of what was expected. Hey, you're going to pay me at the end of the day, and that's, you know, because I need that to survive on. And our society has changed a little bit. But, you know, I've worked for 
uh, you know, my, my boss now is my pastor, Pastor Anderson. I've worked for another boss. Uh, my, my last pastor, he hired me for a time, and they've, they've both said, hey, if you ever need to get paid the same day, just let me know. We'll cut you a check. You know, if there's ever a need, you just say, hey, I, I need my wages for today. You know, we're not going to be in violation of this. So there's different ways that we can steal from people. It's not just this violent crime, although stealing is most certainly a violent crime, and it's often that is the way it's carried out. If you look in Hosea chapter 4, verse 1, it says, Hear the word of the Lord, ye children of Israel, for the Lord hath a controversy with the inhabitants of the land, because there is no truth, nor mercy, nor knowledge of God in the land. By swearing, and lying, and killing, and stealing, and committing adultery, they break out, and blood toucheth blood. He's saying, look, there, he has a controversy with them. Why? Because there is no truth. There is no mercy. There is no knowledge of God in the land. And why is that? By swearing and by lying and killing and stealing and committing adultery, they break out. He's saying, look, the reason why there is no truth, the reason why there is no mercy is because all these sins are taking place in your land. And we would all say, oh, the, you know, the, 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 the lying and the killing and the adultery and all this, this is wicked. Well, and the stealing, too. You know, we shouldn't be doing that either. But we'll compare it to these other sins and say, well, you know, if I had to commit one, I guess it would be stealing. But it's still, it's still wicked. It's some, something we should do. And look, it says there at the end, they break out and blood toucheth blood. I mean, it's getting to the place where they're killing one another. And, and why? Because they're coveting and taking things that don't belong to them. So stealing, you know, we can, you know, of course there is the context of it being, take, uh, of it being a very violent crime. But let's not also forget that it can also be done very subtly. Where maybe we're not killing people, but we might be doing it in other ways. You know, we might be you know, shaving off a little time off the clock, leaving a little earlier, staying than we actually stayed, or what have you. Taking a longer break than we actually marked down on our timesheet, that type of a thing. It's possible. It's out there. <coughs> but stealing is a violent crime. I mean, in, in any shape and form, you know, even if you were to say, well, I didn't kill anybody, I didn't rob anybody, it's still always a violent crime because of the fact that at a minimum, it affects people financially. It affects people financially, and that is violating somebody. And if you don't believe me, you know, I'll, <laughs> I'll send up Brother Gabriel over there, and he'll, he'll come get your wallet after <laughs> church, and you'll say, well, it's violated, right? Mm -hmm. I'm not going to do that. He would do that anyway. <laughs> but, I mean, if someone's taking your money by force, <coughs> IRS, you know, that is stealing. You know, and it's violent. I mean, we get violated, you know, every tax season, every paycheck. You know, you go through your pay stub, and you see that those taxes coming out. You know, you feel violated. That's because you are. Because anytime you're you're coercing somebody under threat of imprisonment to pay taxes, you know that is stealing. So, but that's another st sermon for another time. I shouldn't just throw things out there, but I think every I see some heads nodding. I think everyone's with me on that one. So, <coughs> hopefully the IRS doesn't come out at me now. But look, at a minimum, even even if we're just stealing through blue blue collar crime, we're not killing anybody. Blood's not breaking out. You know. And we're still harming people and violating them because of the fact that we're affecting them financially. You know, and, and this has kind of been in my mind because, you know, and some people already know about this, but, uh, you know, recently at our church up in Tempe, we had a church vehicle that was, had the catalytic converters cut out of it. Now, who knows what I'm talking about with the catalytic converters? Yeah. You know, there's these different, you know, precious metals that are in these converters on all vehicles, you know, part of these EPA emissions and things like that. And what'll happen is guys will go around, you know, and it's just part of the muffler system. I'm giving you all the tricks tonight, aren't I? Like, <laughs> I'm telling you about the sawdust. I'm telling you how to get that catalytic, you know, you know. Uh, and, and, and they would go in and they'll and they'll cut it right out of the pipes. You know, they'll just take a sawzall, battery operated. You want about an 18 volt? No, <laughs> <laughs> minimum 18 volt. You got to get a sharp blade, bimetal. You know, I recommend Milwaukee, and uh, Milwaukee brand is the one you want to use. Don't get the cheap DeWalt's. But, uh, you know, these guys, they, we, one day, you know, uh, I, get a, I was sick. I think it was out with COVID, and pastor calls me and says, hey, I just fired up the van here at church, you know, it was a Sunday, and he says, and the thing sounds like a hot rod. I was like, well, when I get better, I'll, I'll look at it. And I fired that thing up. I mean, it's just deafening loud. It's just like instantly, you know, great, catalytic converter. Cut it right out in the church parking lot. That'll shame. And th they're not gentle about it. It's not like they make nice, clean cuts, and they're careful not to hit anything else. I mean, they cut through the O2 sensor. They broke the linkage to the transmission. 
So I had to get it towed to the, the trans transmission shop, then it get towed over the muffler shop, then get it back to the transmission guy. It was just this big mess. It took like six weeks to finally get it back. You know, and, and but here's the thing, you know, that guy that stole that is probably going to get about 40 bucks for it. He's going to get about 40 bucks for that catalytic converter. They cost like $1,200 or something like that, depending on what you get. Now, if you own a Prius, you know, those are the ones they really go after because those have rhodium in them, I guess, which is this really rare metal. And when you start looking this stuff up, you know, catalytic converter theft, the Priuses are just, that's who, that's, if they see a Prius, they're going to get it. You know, and when this happened, I called the, the uh, local shops to see who could do the repairs. And they're just telling me, yeah, there's a big, big run on them. Big run on them right now. And then, you know, the, the apartments right down the road from us that we used to live in, South Point Apartments, uh, you know, we were trying to do something with the other van. Like, hey, we got an employee that lives down there. Maybe ask the landlord if we can park the van, a van down there. Because once we get it back, you know, it's just going to happen again. We, gotta, we can't leave this thing here overnight. So he calls his landlord at the apartment and says, well, we just had the same thing happen here last night. A tenant had the same thing. He come cut it right out of his car. Well, they're great. And then I took it to the, the new van, I you know, new to us. I took it across the street yesterday for an oil change. And the guy behind the counter, I'm getting rung up. He, he brings it up. He said, hey, have you had any problem with catalytic converters? I said, yeah. <laughs> As a matter of fact, I have. He said, yeah, I had a, a customer's car parked right out here. And so they did the same thing. And they're just doing it everywhere. And it's just this big run. But here's the thing, you know, you'd say, oh, it's, it's just a catalytic converter. The guy said, well, you know, the catalytic converter, you know, it's going to cost you a few hundred dollars. You know, I mean, it, the, the part isn't that much. Yeah, but it's going to cost the tow truck. It's going to cost, you know, the, the labor, the time the church is paying me to call the shops, arrange the thing. I mean, it all adds up. So to the, the thief in his mind says, oh, it's just this little theft. It's not a big deal. It's just petty crime. They don't see how all the costs that actually are associated with that theft. You know, and that's, that's us being violated financially. We have been violated financially. Oh, theft is always a violent crime, even if you're just stealing things. You know, you're, not, you know, you're doing it in the dark of night. You're, you're sneaking in. You're sneaking out. Nobody saw you. You didn't have to club anybody over the head or whatever. It still hurts people. And then there is, of course, you know, when it is more violent physically, people are often hurt or killed in the act of in robbery. I mean, that's what we saw in Hosea, right? The stealing that was taking place, that contributed to the fact, as he said, that blood toucheth blood. There's just so much blood being spilled in the land because of all the people being stolen from, just being violated and killed because of all the robbers that were in the land. Go over to Proverbs chapter 1, Proverbs chapter 1. If you remember Paul in 2 Corinthians, when he's kind of recounting all the things that he had gone through, all the things that he had suffered for the Lord's sake, you know, he said he was in journeyings often. He was in perils of water. One of the things we kind of gloss over is the fact that it says he was in perils of robbers. I mean, people are, he's trying to tra go around and spread the gospel, to, you know, to the, to the Gentiles, and pe he's getting robbed. People are trying to take th everything he's got. In perils by my own countrymen, and so on and so forth. And Scripture warns us about violent robbers. Here in Proverbs chapter 1, it says, verse 10, My son, is a, if sinners entice thee, consent thou not. If they say, come, li uh, come with us, let us lay for wait for blood, let us lurk privily for the innocent without cause. Look, this isn't just some, you know, crackhead who wants to just go rip off a catalytic converter, you know, and get his fix. This is somebody who wants to lurk privily for the innocent blood, the innocent without cause. Let us swallow them up alive as the grave and whole as those that go down to the pit. We shall find all precious substance. I mean, there's people out there that are so motivated by greed that they're willing to kill people. We shall fill our houses with spoil. Cast in thy lot among us and let us all have one purse. My son, walk not thou in the way with them. Refrain thy foot from their path for their feet run to evil and make haste to shed blood. Surely in vain the net is spread in the sight of any bird and they lay wait for their own blood. They lurk privily for their own lives. So are the ways of everyone that is greedy of gain, which taketh away the life of the owners thereof. He's saying, don't be fooled by these people. They're going to say, oh, we're going to get away with it. Just put on this ski mask. We'll be right outside around the corner with the engine running. You know, the, you know, the gun's not even loaded. Just run into that store and shove it in their face and get whatever you can. And you, people start getting involved in violent crime. But what, you know, there, no one ever goes into it thinking, well, maybe it might be for my own life. You know, maybe the guy behind the counter is going to come up with a double barrel, you know, and not, you know, he's, it, 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 then it's on. 
And a lot of times that, that's how things turn out for people. And, and, you know, Scripture warns us about people getting involved in stealing and theft because on the surface it looks like, oh, that's a quick, easy way, quick, easy way to make money. You know, a, 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 a few hours out a night I can go, you know, I can just go down Southern Avenue in Tempe and just go look for cars that are left out in these dark parking lots with a Sawzall. You know, I can cut one. I mean, you could cut off a catalytic converter, you know, in minutes. You know, I, if I can get a few an hour, I mean, 40 bucks, you know, I could be making two, three, 400 bucks an hour, whatever, and have a nice little take. And then I can, you know, <laughs> just be on easy street for a while. But he's, the Bible's warning us here that the net is spread in the sight of any bird, and they lay wait for their own blood. You know, it's going to come back on their own head. So are the, way, uh, the, the ways of everyone that is greedy of gain. And I remember always, he, you'd hear in the news every now and then about people who have been, you know, the, just the serial robberies that have been taking place. And, you know, one of the best ways that the police have used to combat that is by putting out a reward. And with, for anyone that has any information leading to, the, you know, the, the arrest or conviction of, of whoever's, you know, responsible. And now who do you think they're trying to appeal to in that instance? Just, the, just the, the, you know, John Q. Public who happened to see something? No, they're trying to appeal to the other guys that that guy's running with. As they say, there's no honor among thieves. And they think, hey, we're all in on this. Hey, I know, I know so-and-so, he, he was running with us. And if we all agree to turn him in, you know, anonymously, you know, we, we could make 50 grand, we could make 20 grand, whatever. People turn each other in all the time. So if, you, if we get this idea that we can just get away with it, that we can just go out there and, you know, get involved in this kind of activity, this crime, stealing, being a thief, a robber, don't be surprised if it comes back on your own head. <coughs> the Bible says in Proverbs 29, Whoso is partner with a thief hateth his own soul. He hateth his own soul. If you're going to partner up with somebody who's going to rob and rip people off, he hates his own soul. You know, and of course, Proverbs 1, one where we read, he's talking about people who are doing it very wickedly. They're talking about going out and lurking privately for, for, people, for innocent blood, to swallow them up alive as the pit and as the grave. But, you know, what we don't think about sometimes is maybe we get involved in a, in a business dealing with somebody. Or maybe we end up working for somebody who says, yeah, you know what, go ahead and charge more than we should. Or go ahead and, you know, don't do the work and bill them anyway. You know, that kind of thing's out there. You get into service industries and stuff like that. You know, and I, I'm glad I never really had to work for anybody like that. And we kind of had that understanding. In fact, I had a boss I worked for as a locksmith, and he, he would send me out, and it would have been so easy. It would have been just so easy to tell this sweet little old lady that her whole lock set needs to be replaced for hundreds of dollars because it's broken, when all it really needed was just a little of WD-40 or whatever. And then and that's it. And often he would send me out in that job, and I'd tell him what's wrong. He's like, yeah, just do it for her. Don't charge her nothing. And, and then we get a call back from the grandson or whatever. Hey, I really appreciate what you did. You know, come over and do my locks now. And that's where you make your money at doing, you know, honest work. So we always think about, you know, being a thief or being a robber as being, you know, you know the bank robber, the mugger, whatever. But it could be, you know, just dishonest dealings out in the workforce, you know, telling people half truths. And let me tell you something. The locksmith industry is rife with this kind of thing. Because how many times do you have to call a locksmith in your life? Pretty rare, right? This is going to be a little public service announcement about locksmithing, all right? I got to get this off my chest. It's because, you know, it's e locksmithing, it's not like ordering a pizza. You don't call up and know exactly how much this should cost for a large pepperoni and mushroom, right? You know, or a sausage or green pepper, whatever your tune is, right? You know about what you're going to pay when you call certain services. But a lot of people, when they call a locksmith, they've never called a locksmith before. They're calling a locksmith. They're, they're stranded out in some parking lot somewhere. They lost their keys. Don't have, they're in the car, whatever. They're kind of at the locksmith's mercy. I mean, you can kind of tell them whatever they want. Here's what most people do. They get out their smartphone, and the first guy that's got a Google ad, that's who they call. 24-7 locksmith. <laughs> don't ever call those guys because they'll charge you hundreds and hundreds of dollars. I've had people come into a locksmith shop and show me an invoice for the, they, the guy got locked out in his bank. His keys were in his truck and 24 seven locksmith or whoever shows up and opens his door and takes his keys, puts them in his pocket and says 300 bucks. Now that's a good way to get beat up. <laughs> I, don't know, I would never be so bold to do that. The guy went into his bank, withdrew $300 and gave it to him. 
And he came into our shop a few days later and said, did I get ripped off? And I said, yep. I would have charged you 85 bucks to come out and do that. And that happens all the time. So, you know, there's a little PSA about the locksmithing. But that's a good example of, of the type of thing that goes on. People don't, you know, the, the, the thief and the robber isn't always going to come with a ski mask on. You know, he's going to come in a service uniform. He's going to come and give you a bad quote or try to take advantage of you in some way. And look, we should not partner up with people like that. We should not work for people like that. You know, I remember when I was looking for different locksmith jobs, those, and here's another little job advice, employment advice. If they're always hiring, if every time you go on Craigslist or every time you go on Indeed and the same company is always hiring, that's a red flag because the turnover rate's just like this. And there have been people that have gone in there and, and go work for them, and they realize they're working for a bunch of crooks and criminals. And there's a lot more to that 24-7 that locksmith that I would love to tell you guys about, but you've got to see me after the service for that one. And here's the thing, this needs to be preached because of the fact that it's violent, it's wicked, whether we're doing it through physical, uh, uh, physically, actually physically violating somebody, or whether we're, you know, uh, you know doing uh, dishonest uh, business dealings, it, it's, it's all wicked, okay? And the problem is, and the reason why it needs to be preached is that the world glorifies being a robber. The world lifts it up. They think, they, 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 they glorify theft. I mean, they make all these movies about them. You know, the casino heist movie. You know, I was trying to think of some examples, and I had this throwback, all right? I'll get a, I'll get a, I'll get a, a little bone of the old man move here for a minute, right? We'll get a little worldly. <laughs> you know, Jumpin' Jack Flash with Whoopi Goldberg. Yeah. Nobody. <laughs> right? But she's picking locks. She's robbing people. Th and it's just all kinds of movies. We could probably go around the room. Hey, you ever see a movie where they just made the thieves out into the coolest people around? Yeah, there's a bunch of them. They do it all the time. And they glorify, oh, it's so hip, it's so cool, you know, to be a thief, to rob people. They glorify it. But the Bible says it's wicked. And, and, and you know, society understands it's wicked. They're not going to stand for it, you know, most societies anyway. Go to Exodus chapter 22. And don't let the world fool you into thinking that it's just this cool thing to do and, and that you're going to get away with it and that there's not going to be any punishment. And I'll tell you, the world's punishment, the way the, the society handle it, handles it, is, is worse than anything the Bible prescribes, in my opinion. And I I'm not saying that's right. I think the world goes way too far. And, they, and, and the problem with the, 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 the modern justice system and how they punish stealing and theft is that the victim is very rarely compensated. The, the only people that get, make any money off it are, is the judicial system. The, 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 uh, at the end of the day, the guy who got robbed, the victim, he's just left there with nothing. The Bible has the right way to handle it. If you look at Exodus chapter 22, verse 1, it says, If a man steal an ox or a sheep and kill it or sell it, he shall restore it five oxen for an ox and four sheep for a sheep. He's got to pay back four or fivefold what he took. Now, that's, that's a pretty good system. I would probably start leaving my keys in the car if that were the case, you know what I mean? <laughs> Leave the windows down, you know, keys in it. I know, but the insurance company probably wouldn't approve of that, right? But if, hey, if I'm going to get four or five back, you know, it's almost worth it. If a thief be found breaking up and be smitten that he die, there shall no blood be shed for him. And this is important, too, because I've heard some people, you know, they, they make such statements as, you know, well, if I ever caught a guy, you know, in my, you know, if he ever, if he was ever, if he was out in my driveway cutting out a catalytic converter, he'd be, he'd be getting a lead salad. You know, he'd be, he'd be catching lead. He wouldn't make it out of the end of the driveway. Well, in certain instances, that might be right. That might be okay to do. But, you know, you can't just have this mentality that, that you're going to kill somebody over, I mean, what you're saying is you're putting a price on a man's soul at that point. You know, people, and, and I, I remember uh, a pastor who told me a story about, you know, his church, a church that he was a member of, somebody had come in and taken all the stereo equipment, all the audio equipment out of the church. I mean, thousands and thousands and thousands of dollars worth of equipment, just gone. And they were at an immense prayer meeting, and some guy prays, Lord, I pray you kill that guy. Look, there's, a, there, there's time and place to pray imprecatory prayers for people. But some guy stealing a bunch of audio equipment out of a church isn't one of them. You know, my, the, the, my pastor at that time, he was telling me that story, and he said, I just thought to myself, you just put a price on that man's soul. And what's that price to you? A few thousand bucks? 
I mean, if I walked out and saw a guy ripping off my catalytic converter, I, you know, I'd probably try to scare him off or catch him and get a phone out and get some video, but I'm not going to pull out, you know, a gun and, and start going to town and doing work, you know, because it's not worth it. It's not worth, you know, it's just, a, it's just a thing. It can be replaced. Human life, you know, cannot be just replaced. Once that guy's dead, that's it. And if he's not saved, you know, that's, he's in hell. So it says in verse 2, and that's why I'm bringing it up, because if a th it says, if a thief be found breaking up and he be smitten that he die, there shall no sh blood be shed for him. Oh, see, we're justified. Uh, 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 verse 3, if the son be risen upon him, there shall be no blood shed for him. So it clarifies it, for he should make full restitution. If he, uh, if he have nothing, then he shall be sold for his theft. I mean, that's a pretty good system. People say, well, you know, the, these guys don't have anything to pay back anyway. Okay, well, it's called being a bond servant. Now I'm gonna, you know, now he gets sold and goes and works for another guy, and I get a cut of his wages. I garnish his wages until I get compensated four or fivefold, depending on what he stole. It says in verse four, if the theft be certainly found in his hand alive, whether it be ox or ass or sheep, he shall restore double. If a man shall cause a field or a vineyard to be eaten, he shall be and shall put in his beast, and that shall feed in another man's field. Uh, uh, the beast of his own field and the best of his own vineyard, he shall make restitution. So not only is this the humane way to handle people who are thieves, because how do we handle it today? We put them in a cell for years, and then they have a record when they get out, and they can't go live a normal life. It gets hung over their head. That's not humane. Okay, This is humane. It's not only is it humane, but it actually compensates the victim. The victim is actually gets paid back. You know, things are actually made right. It's not the way it works today in our system. Go over to Luke chapter 23. Luke chapter 23. You know, and, and I will say this, you know, our system today, as flawed it is, as it is, is still more humane, you know, <laughs> you know, arguably maybe, as other systems. You know, the, root, the Romans crucified thieves. It was the death penalty. They would, they would, they would nail you to a cross. That's, I mean, we see that in, in, in Jesus' crucifixion. It says that there were two thieves crucified with him. You know, the two other people that were there, that that was their crime. They had stolen something. Now look at Luke twenty-three. This always, you know, I don't want to say it cracks me up, but always, you hear what this guy says, and you're like, even the thieves don't don't see how how bad the system is. It says in verse thirty-nine, Luke twenty-three thirty-nine. And one of the malefactors which were hanged, on, were hanged railed on him, saying, If thou be the Christ, save thyself and us. But the ans other answering rebuked him, saying, Dost thou not thou fear God, seeing thou art in the same condemnation? And we indeed justly, for we receive the due reward of our deeds. That's crazy to me that this guy is hanging up there and thinking, No, nah, I deserve this. You know, I stole something. I don't care how big a thing you stole or whatever you did. That's, that's not right. <laughs> you know, now I understand, you know, if, if, if somebody's breaking into your house at night and you don't know why they're there and you fear for your life or the life of your loved ones or their well-being, then yeah, that's justified. But, you know, if someone's just, you know, out in your backyard running off with a bike, grabbing some tools or whatever, you know, th that's not a threat to your life. And it's just crazy to me when you read this, this guy, he's up there and he thinks, yeah, this is what I deserve. You know, and people read that and say, see, that's what the Bible teaches. No, that's not. That's just the Bible telling us what this guy said. Exodus is what the Bible teaches should be done. So the Romans, I mean, at least our system isn't that bad. We're, we're, we're publicly executing people for theft. I mean, you could make the debate, you know, depending on how long they're put away for in some cell somewhere. Maybe that is a fate worse than death. I don't know. <coughs> how about the Muslims, right? The religion of peace. They teach amputation. That's the punishment there. As for the thief, I'm reading to you from the Quran. The male and the female amputate their hands in recompense for what they've earned as a deterrent from Allah. And Allah is exalted in might and wise. That's their solution. Just cut off the hand. Well, if I'm the guy that gets stolen from, do I at least get the hand? Do I get it in a jar? I can say, yeah, you know, put it out in my front yard. This is what happens to thieves around here. Hey, look, I know all your stuff's gone. It's been pawned off, and the guy spent it all on drugs, but here's his hand. Oh, thanks. Allah is mighty and powerful and wise. Praise be to Allah for this hand. 
<laughs> what a great system, you know. And now the guy doesn't have a hand. Go make an honest living now with one less hand. <laughs> what sense does that make? Just make sure they get the non-dominant hand if they're going to do it. You know, lie to them. It's the left one, I swear. <laughs> Sign something, <laughs> you know, because they got to make a living. And you say, well, that's crazy. Yeah, but a lot of, I've heard a lot of even Americans talk, you know, people who are not Muslims and say, think they can just shoot thieves in any circumstance. You know, the people that just, there's, you know, I'm all for the Second Amendment. I'm all for that. I, I support it. But sometimes I run into people. I've met people. I'm just thinking, you should not carry a gun. <laughs> As I was told, you, you, you leave one of two things behind every day, your gun or your temper. You know, you can't be a hothead and carry a weapon. That's another story. I'm not going to go in there. But Proverbs chapter 6. Go to Proverbs chapter 6. So God's system, you know, his dealing with, Theft is, is appropriate. It's good. It's right. It's the way it should be done. And, you know, don't think that there isn't going to be a punishment for your sin. I don't care how much the, the world glorifies theft. I don't know how cool they make it look or how easy. Or maybe you even know people that are involved in it. And it seems like they're just getting away with it and getting away with it and getting away with it. It will catch up to them eventually. You know, eventually that guy is going to roll into somewhere with a trunk load of, of catalytic converters somewhere. And it's going to be a private investigator. It's going to be an undercover cop. And it's like, oh, all of these are yours, huh? Okay, well, it's going to catch up to him. You know, another example of this is the fact that, you know, in our same church parking lot, just, you know, a few months back, and if you ever get around, if Brother Chris is ever here, get him to tell you the story because he does a lot better job of it than I do. He's out, he's there working late one night, and he hears something out in the parking lot, right outside our office door where his van is parked. And he looks, there's this red car parked there. And I don't know what brought it on, but the guy was up to something. And Chris opens the door, and he's kind of like, because he didn't know what's going to happen. Hey, and the guy goes running off. And he running off, and he run, takes off across the parking lot, leaves his car parked right next to his van. So he gets in his van. He's kind of looking around, and he looks over, and he's already on the, on the phone with the cops because, you know, we've had people siphon gas out of the vans and <laughs> everything else. Don't ever leave your car there, folks, <laughs> you know, if you ever have to. And... Uh, He's on the cops. He's on the phone with the cops. He looks over in the guy's van or out of his van window. He could see down the guy's car, and he sees a license plate just laying there in the back seat. So he, and so he gets out and he goes back to his back of his van. His license plate's gone. <laughs> he goes, "That's my license plate." The guy was taking his license plate off. So he gets his license plate out and he's kind of looking around and there's just all kinds of stuff in there. There's tools. I mean, this guy's just been. He actually stole the tools from the maintenance guy in broad daylight when they had been working just a few s suites down. Drove by, re reached in the back of his pickup, and just threw all of his tools in there. And, he, and the guy had filed a police report. And then the next night, he's back in the same parking lot trying to rip off you know, his Chris's license plate. So he gets on the phone, and he's got the cops coming. And, uh, and he's trying to think. He doesn't want to be there because he didn't know if the guy went to go get his buddies, went to go get a club or a gun or whatever. He's going to come back and you know, try to take what's his or what he thinks is his. So he gets in his van. He's still on the phone with dispatch. And no, before he leaves, I got to tell the story. I can't. I mean, I, I'm, I can tell you want to know, right? right. <laughs> he gets the bright idea. He's thinking, well, if I leave, you know, I got to leave. But if I leave, this guy could come back and just take off. And then all these people's stuff never gets returned. So he, he, he's had this big, like, what is it, like a one-ton jack? Like the big ones, you know what I mean? Like the, the long ones for lifting vans. He's been... Man, he's had that thing around the office, and I'm always tripping over it, stubbing my toe, and go, why do we have this jack just laying around? <laughs> it was for a moment, for it, was, it was for a time such as this, <laughs> that that jack was there. It was providence. And he, so he grabs that jack, he rolls it out there, jacks the guy's car up, takes his tire off, brings it inside, locks the door, and, puts his, and just put his vehicle right back down on, without a tire. <laughs> he was gentle about it. He put it back down and just took off. So he's across the street, and he could see the guy's car, and he's on the phone with dispatch, and they're like, and the cops are already been dispatched, and, he, and he's like, and he's explaining the situation. He's like, and, and the guy comes back. He says, oh, he's back now. He's back in his car. And he says, but he's not going anywhere. I took his tire off. <laughs> <laughs> and then Chris tells it better than I do. And he says, uh, the dispatch is like, wait a minute. Are you telling me you stole the tire or he's the thief? And he's like, no, he's the thief. I just took his tire off so I couldn't go anywhere. <laughs> so the squad cars come in. They block the guy in. And he'd taken off the rear passenger tire. The guy just got in the car. Didn't even look to see what was going on. <laughs> and he's sitting there, and the, and the cops, you know, they, they say, hey, what are you doing? He's like, oh, I'm just, I was just across the street going to McDonald's, just going to McDonald's. 
they're like, you, you parked here to go across, you know, like all the way to McDonald's from here? Yeah. <coughs> okay. Well, where are you going now? Oh, I was just going to go to a friend's house. They're like, no, you're not. He's like, well, why not? He says, well, you couldn't go anywhere without a tire. Like, you didn't realize your tire was gone? Oh, no. Oh, you've been here the whole time? And then, you know, it all came out, and the guy, the guy already had a record. He was on probation. They, they didn't book him because, you know, the, cr the jails were filling up. They said, you're going to have to go see a judge, you know, and he's probably going to do more time. But the guy got his tools back, but I'm sure he would have, wouldn't, you know, he would probably wouldn't have minded getting uh, four times the amount of tools or double tools, I guess, would be in this instance. I don't know what that had to do with a lot of anything, but you know what? It was a good story. <laughs> but it just goes to show you that, you know, crime, it, you know, forgive the cliche statement, but it does not pay. And there's no, there's no, I mean, do you think that guy felt cool? When he has, when he has to go to his, tell his probation officer, when he has to call his relatives and say, yeah, I'm going back in for another year or two. I was, I'm up to it again, trying to feed a habit. I mean, it's sad. It's unfortunate. You know, and, 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 and Brother Raymond, you know, he went out there and tried to preach the guy the gospel afterward, but he didn't get saved. But, you know, the, the, the world wants to make it look so cool and glamorous. Your friends want to tell you, oh, it's easy. We can get away with it. Don't worry. You won't get caught until you do. And then it's, it's embarrassing. It's painful. And unfortunately, in our system, it could cost you a lot more than, than, you, than is even, you know, just in the eyes of God. <coughs> You know, and if you were living in a Muslim country under Sharia law, it could literally cost you a hand. <coughs> Bible says in Proverbs chapter 6, verse 30, are you there? Proverbs chapter 6, verse 30. I don't know if I had you turn there or not. It says in Proverbs 6, 30, men do not despise a thief if he steal to satisfy his soul when he is hungry. I mean, at least that's understandably say, man, the guy, they're starving. He doesn't have anything to eat. He's just, he's stealing bread to put it in his mouth so he doesn't starve to death. We're not going to despise him. You know, the guy that's going around cutting catalytic converters off for his drug habit or whatever, I despise that guy. No one's going to have much sympathy for him. So, but look at what it goes on and says. You know, that, that he's talking about, hey, they're not going to despise him. We might even have sympathy for him and say, oh, man, sorry. What a tough position to be in life. What happened to this guy? What, what went on in his life that he has to steal just to put food in his mouth? But if he be found, he shall restore sevenfold. And that's not, and remember, the Bible doesn't prescribe that. It prescribes double. And he's just talking about the fact that, you know, don't expect men, don't expect mankind to go easy on you. You know, God has what he lines out, but the reality is, is that man goes way beyond what is, what is appropriate. So if we get caught, you know, y you know, we think, oh, it's going to be an easy life. It's going to be cool. I'm just going to be this thief. I'm going to be this robber. It's going to be easy street for me. You know, and, and, but here's the thing. Man is going to take it even beyond what God has prescribed. Even in the instance like this, where he says, hey, they don't despise a thief when he's stealing to put food in his belly, but he shall restore sevenfold. <laughs> he shall give all the substance of his house. I mean, they'll take everything they can get from you. <coughs> you know, God's system, thieves should just be forced to make amends with the person they stole from and then move on with their life. Right. But the reality of, of it is, is that mankind, man, will chop off hands, crucify you, take everything that you own. So it's just not worth it. It never is to begin with, but it's even worse when man's running the show. And we think, well, I'm never going to do that. I'm never going to go cut catalytic converters off. I'm never going to go over to Faithful Word in the middle of the night and try to take Chris Segura's license plate <laughs> or anything else he has. I learned my lesson. I don't need, you know, I'm not going to ever do that. But here's the thing. Stealing can take other forms, can it? Stealing isn't always just us going, you know, and robbing things, you know, in, that don't belong to us. You know, I talked about, you know, we could do that on the job. We could do that, you know, through charging more than we should, through dishonest dealings, you know, stealing on the clock. This is something you see a lot. You know, I, 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 I remember a guy, you know, when I first got saved, I worked at a furniture company. They sold furniture and we would deliver it. And often we'd have to do, we'd have to, we'd have to rearrange the showroom, which was a lot of fun. You'd be out with the salespeople, put that over there, put that over there, you know. And, they're just, and you'd have to be moving this furniture around, and you'd just be in there for hours, just rearranging the showroom, you know, and, and no one liked doing it. None of the furniture moving guys, none of us enjoyed it, but it was our job, so we got paid to do. And I remember we were out there for like an entire afternoon one time, 
and we, were, we just thought this other guy was off doing something else. And we go back there, and a little while later, he comes out. Oh, man, I was just in the boiler room that whole time taking a nap. Guy was napping on the job for hours. You know, and it was just like, you're a thief. What else do you call that? To get paid to go sleep when you're supposed to be working? So that kind of thing goes on. Maybe we're not going to go around with the Sawzall or put sawdust in motors and, and whatever. But if we're trimming off the clock, you know, if we're, if we're lying and, 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 and on the timesheet, if we're, if we're, you know, sleeping when we're supposed to be working, you know, that is another form of theft. And that might be something that people who wouldn't do some of these other things might be a little bit more prone to do. And look, I'm not, here's the thing. And I don't want to be like, people they hear that and then they just become these like sticklers. You know what I mean? But, you know, and, and I've talked to other employ employers and, 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 it, and there's this thing where it all kind of comes out in the wash. I get that. And, and we don't nickel and dime each other over every 10 minutes. You know, well, I worked 10 minutes over today. Yeah, but, you know, there was this 10-minute thing here where, you know, you did bill. But you know what I'm saying? Like, I, I understand there's give and take. And I've even had my employers come to me and say that. Like, look, there's give and take here when it comes down to this, you know, the exact moment and minute when you did this or that. But, look, when you're going into the boiler room and sleeping for hours, or, you're, you know, you're just taking, you say, oh, I took a half-hour break. You really took an hour break. You know, that's, that's not just something that's going to come out in the wash. That is stealing. And we might not do some of these other things, but that might be something we're a little more tempted to do. <coughs> Stealing on the time clock, uh, you know, petty theft of materials. You know, that's another thing that you, you hear a lot of about is, is, is the, you know, companies, the most theft happens in-house. It's from the employees. They steal more than anybody. 80% of all theft happens within the company through people just, you know, lying or, taking things, home, so on and so forth. And so why would anybody do that? How could people, because here's the thing, people begin to justify that theft in their mind. When they steal from an employer, what they'll do is they'll justify it in their mind. They'll say, this isn't me stealing. You know, me slipping this $300 into my pocket, you know, that's not stealing. That's me getting compensated for what I'm really worth. I'm underpaid. That I, sh I deserve this money. They owed me this. That's what, but that's the type of thing that goes on in people's minds when they start to steal from their employer. They think, you know, I'm worth more than they're paying me, so I'm going to go ahead and just pay myself a little bit more. When it's really stealing is what's taking place. Go to 1 Peter chapter 4. We'll wrap it up here. 1 Peter chapter 4. The Bible says in Ephesians chapter 4, verse 28, let him that steal, stole, steal no more. You know, what's God's answer? You know, make restitution and stop doing it. Let him that stole, steal no more, but leather... Rather, let him labor, you know, with both hands, by the way. Let him labor, working with his hands. <laughs> Plural. <laughs> both hands, the thing which is good, that he may be give to him that needeth. You know, that's how you're going to pay that back. You know, maybe you're never going to get drugged into a court of law for things that you've stolen in the past. Maybe those people are so far gone and far removed from your life, you couldn't even track them down to pay them back if you could wanted to. But you know what you can do is you can stop stealing and work hard, and then start actually helping people that have a need. That's how you can pay that back and make that restitution. 1 Peter 4, where as you turn, says this in verse 14, If you be reproached for the name of Christ, happy are ye, for the spirit of glory and of God resteth upon you. On their part he is evil spoken of, but on your part he is glorified. So it's good if we suffer for the name of Christ. But if we're going to suffer as any of these other things, you know, that's not good. But let none of you, it says in verse 15, suffer as a murderer. It's like, oh, I'd never do that. Of course not. Not me. I'm not going to murder anybody. Yeah, or as a thief. Well, you know, I mean, what's, what's an extra hour or two a week on the, on that, that, you know, me leaving early or coming in late that they don't know about? Or what's a, what's an hour, you know, what's a few hours of me napping in the, in the boiler room while I'm supposed to be working? Is it really that big a deal? Me just taking some things home and helping myself to materials or whatever? Well, it is thieving. It is stealing. And we should not suffer as a thief or as an evildoer or as a busybody in other men's matters. And look, here's the thing about theft. It's, it's frustrating when it happens to you. You know, it, 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 that's, you know, a lot of people who, st who have stolen, they kind of stop stealing when they get stolen from and they realize how infuriating it is right. to have somebody just taking things from you that don't belong to them. It's, it's very frustrating. And, and look, a lot of times people, you know, you can see why men, they get frustrated and they just go overboard with it. 
Oh, you stole some bread? You know, sevenfold, I'm taking everything you got. You know, two years, you know, plus probation. You know, oh, you stole a car? It's just, you know, they just drop the hammer at them out of just frustration, and they think that's what's going to dissuade people from doing it. But here's the thing, you know, it, and it is frustrating. I understand that. But just think about the fact that the most important things, that the things that matter most in life cannot be stolen from you. I mean, they can't. You know, if we, if our heart, you know, it, it, where if, wherever your, tr- your heart is, there will your treasure be also. You know, if we store up treasures in heaven, where if our heart is in heaven, that's where our treasures are going to be. Where neither thieves nor mo- break through, where, where, th- where moth or rust does not corrupt, and where thieves do not break through nor steal. And these uh, things that people take from us are just that. They're just things. Right. They're stuff. I understand it's frustrating, but you know what? We're, uh, we should never go to the point of just we're going to get vindictive, we're going to be vengeful. You know, it'd be great if we had a system where we could get paid back and made, you know. I, I, you know, I asked, I said, hey, should we report this to the police? They said, would it do any good? You know, the pastor said, would it even do any good? You know, they're probably so busy with other crimes, they would just, pfft, they'd laugh at that. But then I got to thinking, like, would I really want to that guy to go to jail for that? I mean, is, it, is the catalytic converter, as frustrating as it is, and all the headache that it was over these last few weeks of getting that van repaired, is it really worth seeing that guy get put away for years, maybe? You know, and, and, and people will say, well, of course, no, he needs to be punished for his crime. I understand that. I understand that. You know, I'm not going to say you're, if you're wrong, if you feel that way. But to me, sometimes I just go, is it even worth it? You know, tell that to the guy with one hand in some Muslim country somewhere. Well, he's, you know, you've, you've been, you've been, uh, you've, you've suffered justly for your deeds, like that guy on the cross. I'd rather just see the guy get let go and maybe come to his senses, maybe get saved and, and, and stop it someday. But, you know, we, so we should not get so frustrated with people when we get stolen from. I understand it's frustrating, and they, and they definitely, you know, there needs to be some kind of restitution, but if maybe that's bothering us a little t- more than it should, maybe it's because of the fact that our treasures aren't in heaven. We're more concerned with the things of this earth. And if we would just store up treasure there, you know, that's, I mean, that's more secure than Fort Knox. Mm-hmm. No one's breaking through into heaven. Right. That stuff's going to be there waiting for you. Guaranteed. So that's the message tonight. You know, stealing is a sin. It's not something we should just gloss over. You know, it's not something we should let the world tell us is cool. It's not something we should let other people pressure us into or talk us into or think we're just always going to get away with. And it's definitely not something we want to go to an extreme with when it comes to punishing other people. And let's just remember that, you know, the most important things that matter uh, cannot be stolen from us. And we that those are the things that we should acquire. Those are the things that we should invest in. Souls, godly living, you know, all of these things. The, the treasures in heaven that cannot be stolen. Let's go ahead and pray.